بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد This is the section on the Quran where the author is speaking about the Quran because it's so linked to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Makkah Mukarrama is the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty is on display and manifested. That's why things are faster there. Makkah is a bigger city and a more busier city to start with anyway. But it's hotter as well than Medina Munawwara. And everything is like a frenzy. Everything is fast. In the mataf, while you're doing tawaf, there's a lot of movement. You're going to be shoved around a bit. It's all aspect of the purification. Whereas in Medina Munawwara, you go there and it's... So Makkah kind of represents the Father's majesty. The haba, the awe that a person generally has of their father. And when you go to Medina Munawwara, it's like you've just gone into your mother's lap. The soft power is on display there. Everything is so calm and it's so amazing. And that's the Prophet Sallallahu mercy which is on full display there and manifest there. And this is what we've been discussing. You can actually feel the difference in the way people just deal with you in Makkah, which is different from there. It's beauty in Medina Munawwara, the aspect, the attributes of beauty are on display, whereas in Makkah Mukarrama it's majesty. It's the might which is on display there. The house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says here, قَرَّتْ بِهَا عَيْنُ قَارِيهَا فَقُلْتُ لَهُ لَقَدْ ظَفِرْتَ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ فَاعْتَصِمِي إِن تَتْلُهَا خِيفَةً مِّنْ حَرِّ نَارِ لَظَى أَطْفَعْتَ نَارَ لَظَى مِنْ وَرْدِهَا أَشَّبِمِي كأنها الحوض تبيض الوجوه به من العصاة وقد جاء وقد جاءوه كالحمم وقصرات وكالميزان معدلة فالقست من غيرها في الناس لم يقم لا تعجبا لحسود راح ينكرها تجاهلا وهو عين الحاذق الفهم قد ينكر العين ضوء الشمس من رمد وينكر الفم so he's speaking about the Quran and after discussing everything that he did before, speaking about the marvels of the Quran and its mu'jiza, its miracle, and how its characteristics are, he says, they delighted the soul and senses of the one that recited them, meaning the verses of the Quran delighted the soul and senses of the one that recited them. So I told him. Yours is God's rope, so hold on tight. So the one who's reading the Quran, I'm telling him, this is the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is your main link to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hold on to it tight, which is the Quran. If you recite them in fear of a blazing fire, their wellsprings shall extinguish that fire and heat. So the Quran is the source of protection from the fire of Jahannam. Like the pool of paradise, they make sinners' face shine, though they had come to it as black as charcoal. So just like in the hereafter, people who will come out of the hellfire will be totally darkened and really, really burnt out from the hellfire. When they have a dip in the ma'ul hayat, in the water of life, in that pool, in that hawd, then they will come out totally glistening and vibrant and fresh again. Likewise, people who come to the Qur'an with dark hearts and with darkness in their life, the waters, the verses of the Qur'an act like the water of the hereafter where it purifies the heart. Like the bridge over hell and the balance of right, justice made by another shall not be true among mankind. If you use any other standard of justice other than the Qur'an, it won't work. Be not amazed at an envier who denies them. But there are people who still deny the Qur'an. So he said, don't be amazed by that. Don't be shocked by that. 
pretending unawareness though he has a deep understanding this person inside knows the reality of the Quran but it's out of jealousy so he says because a sick eye may deny the light of the sun a sick tongue may even abhor the taste of pleasant water when you're, when, when you're not feeling well then you drink water, you drink something else it just tastes really bad even though it is probably the most tastiest thing that somebody's giving you a person who has cataracts in their eyes could deny that the sun exists or the sun is out because they can't see it but that doesn't affect the sun it doesn't affect the pleasantness of the drink you're giving them it's just the problem is in the recipient so he says قَرَّتْ بِهَا عَيْنُ قَارِيهَا فَقُلْتُ لَهُ لَقَدْ ذَفِرْتَ بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ فَاعْتَصِمِي that the one who recites the Quran his eyes are going to be gladdened by the recitation so then I want to, I want to encourage the person and I say فَقُلْتُ لَهُ I say to that person you have succeeded with the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you've held on to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so now hold on to it fast make sure you don't give this up at all don't become lazy now so the verses are those which gladden the eyes of the reciter the person becomes very satisfied by the recitation and extremely happy that's because it affects the heart especially if you read the Quran with meaning it's gonna really affect your heart when things are affecting your heart then the heart governs the rest of the body so then you're gonna feel better about it in shirahu sadr they call it which is the expansion of the heart when a person feels downcast and low and a person is feeling sad and in some kind of grief or depressed then he feels very contracted there's no expansion and uh, subhanallah just by the way people sit sometimes people will interact with them in that way there's a study done about where you can see confidence in people in the way they sit people who are not very confident and they, they, they've come to meet you or they're, they're in an interview or something, they will kind of sit all crouched. Whereas people who are very confident, they're going to be larger than life. They're going to kind of like relax and kind of stretch out and be very confident. Not like recline and be lousy, but meaning be, be really confident. So th these are effects that people have in, in different ways. But the heart governs all of these effects, especially when it comes to a spiritual understanding and a uh, a feeling of happiness and being elated about something so when a person reads the Quran with understanding and ponders over it the heart opens up the heart is illuminated and he starts benefiting he or she starts benefiting benefiting from the stories from the verses from the signs the, uh, that are mentioned in the Quran that increases the Iman and that provides more conviction now uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about an increase in Iman. What exactly does increase in Iman mean? So Ibn Khaldun in his Muqaddimah, he has a very interesting understanding of this. He says that there's lots of people who declare that the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is called the verbal declaration. I believe in Allah. Allah is one. There's a lot of people who verbally declare this. But he says there's a difference between Al-Qawl wal ittisaf uh, there's a difference between verbally declaring something and there's a difference between that and actually making that a person's nature and we have to ask ourselves if Tawheed is our nature because if Tawheed becomes our nature then our inclination is towards obedience as a second nature it won't be forced at all I give you it's very that this sounds just very theoretical still but there's one example that he provides which just drives the point home he says this he says and we've had a lot of exposure to this. How many times have you heard a fundraiser? How many times have we heard people speaking about the welfare of others? The poor and the yatim, the orphans and the destitute. The person who's speaking, and this could be any of us. It could be a fundraiser, it could be a scholar, it could be an alim, it could be anybody. We're encouraging somebody else. We know the verses. We know the ahadith. We know the psychological ways of convincing people, telling sad stories, telling bad experiences, helpless situations to get people's hearts moving so that people donate the money. So we understand that it's important to have compassion, to treat softly, to treat gently, to treat with mercy if you see an orphan or if you see a poor person. 
So in theory, we've got it all worked out. We have full belief in it as well. We express it verbally. We can even encourage others with it. But then the test actually comes when uh, an orphan will actually come in front of you or is brought in front of you. How do you deal with that orphan now? Or for example, a poor person is brought in front of you or comes up to you and asks you for money now. Do you feel like a fish out of water? All that you just said in that last fundraiser or you heard in that last fundraiser, which was so convincing and you were totally part of it. Can you now put this into action? Will the mercy come out of your heart? Will the compassion come out of your heart that you can now just second nature start dealing with this individual? Or do we start feeling like go to the imam? So somebody generally outside contacts you about something. Oh, you need to speak to the imam. You need to go to the office. You need to speak to the masjid guys about that. Right? Or you need to, if it's on the street, I don't really have anything. The most you might give is, okay, you might pull out a pound or five pound and you may give it to them. But the, the compassion we speak about, does that come about? With some people it does, but not for everybody. How does that come about? You have to first force it out. Eventually when you do it enough, and you, you can express that compassion and that mercy and softness and gentleness towards that because the Prophet ﷺ told us to do so and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recommends doing that in the Quran as well, then it will become second nature. Now, if we take that on a grander scale of our iman, where does our iman? We believe, we express, but is our iman second nature? Is tawheed our second nature? Is worship of Allah second nature? Or is it still a very convincing dialogue that we do. That's the question that needs to be asked of ourselves. That really puts things in perspective. So when you read the more Quran you recite with pondering, this will come about because it will really, really challenge our hearts and it will really make us think about these things. And of course, there's the reward that are gained by every... I mean, aside from all of these spiritual benefits that you get, an additional benefit you get is that your balance is increasing because for each letter, there are 10 rewards that are promised for each letter that you recite from the Qur'an. So there's all of that in addition. Now, if somebody who reads very, very fast, he's going to get the rewards of reading a letter. He's going to get lots of reward, but the additional benefit of the effect on the heart will not come about as much because you'll just read it so I'm racking up my rewards but I don't really get as much benefit out of it and this is something which we, we, we lack in generally the Quran has some ajeeb benefits there's a hadith which is related by Bukhari Muslim it's Sahih from Usaid ibn Hudayr radiallahu anhu he says that once he was reciting a Quran in Tahajjud it was a night prayer in Tahajjud and <coughs> the story that there's a number of versions of this one, it says that he had his baby next to him. He had his infant lying next to him. And there was a stable close by. He was reading next to You know, in, the, in, in many places in the world today, you still have the stable right next to your house. So you don't want to pray in your house. Your house is just one big room. And next to it is a stable. And subhanAllah, it, it's there. Sometimes it's even in the same room. It's just a big hall and the cows down there at the other end. I've, I've actually seen this in India. So he's, he's reciting Quran and suddenly he sees a lot of turbulence in his horse that is, next, that is close by him. There's a lot of turbulence. And he is now frightened that this, his horse is going to trample over his kid because the horse is just moving on. Then he noticed that there is like a cloud-like formation above. There's a, like a formation of a cloud-like formation, something above. Next day he goes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says that this is what I saw. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, yes, tilka al-mala'ika, those were the angels. In another version it says that that's the sakina that comes down when you recite the Qur'an. Now generally when we're reciting the Qur'an, uh, what's our state when you recite the Qur'an? How many times have we actually recited the Qur'an outside where... We could maybe even observe a phenomenon of that nature. Right? We never even look up. We're always looking around us. We never look up. The sky is not our the sky is not our venue anymore for observation, especially when you're living in a city. And then he the Prophet wasallam said that had you continued like that, then that was a special scene that was taking place. He said, Had you continued like that, the people would have seen it as well in the morning when they came out. So, 
the Quran will open up your heart and it will set your mind aright. So although there's not as many rules in the Quran, there's not as many laws as halal, haram, but it will get your heart to think in the right way. So even without having a mufti present in general, a person who's really attached to the Quran will just get it more righter than others. They'll just, their heart will just bear witness that this is wrong. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, ask your heart. Obviously, he's speaking to an accomplished mu'min, not to any Tom, Dick and Harry out there. Ask your heart. Guy's got a corrupt heart. Yes, this is good for me. That's good for me. And you know, it's, it's not like that. It's whenever a person speaks, they have a certain criteria and a certain target audience in mind. It's just, uh, that's just understood. So you can't misapply this hadith. So that's why if you have, mashallah, been able to attach yourself to the Qur'an, and inshallah we can, and those who have, alhamdulillah, may Allah increase it. So then he is encouraging them and he's saying that, look, you've attached yourself with the strongest line to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strongest line to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hold on to it fast. And those who haven't attached themselves, attach yourself and hold on to it fast. May Allah give us a tawfiq. May Allah open up our... May Allah expand us through the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate us through the Qur'an. Make it the rabi'a qulubina. Make it the spring of our heart. That's why he says, the Prophet sallallahu dua is this, that make it a spring of our heart. Wajila'a ahzanina. And make it a removal of our cares, our worries, our concerns. The Qur'an can do that. And the way it does that is quite interesting. It's the best counselor you can have. But you have to interact with it. This is not some kind of mythical idea. It's genuine. you got a problem, open up a Quran. If you understand Arabic, you're very lucky. If you don't, then read it with the translation. And generally, something's gonna, something is going to calm you down. There's going to be a verse, you'll probably be on the same page. I've tried this so many times in many, many instances. Generally, on the same page. Something that would seem irrelevant to you, if you're reading it superficially. It will provide a, some kind of guidance in your matter. There'll be a story, there'll be something that will just connect with you. Because that's what the Quran does. That is how powerful it is. Try it. Try it with an open heart. Then he says, "In tatluha khifatam min harri nari jahannam." So now he continues to expound on the benefits of reading the Quran. Not only will it benefit you here, and not only have you attached yourself to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the strongest link to Allah, but if you read it khifatam, out of fear, if you read it and you have fear, min harri nari lava. Lava is a uh, is one of the names of uh, one of the hellfires. One of the parts of the hellfire is called lava. There's a number of different ones, Lava, uh, Jahim, there's the Nar, there's Jahannam, Sa'ir, there's Hawiya. These are the different names of Hellfire. So Lava is one of them. Kalla innaha Lava, Nazaratan Lishawa. So uh, if you read it uh, with fear in your heart from the, the heat of the Hellfire called Lava, then you would have extinguished the fire of lava with its cool water, the cool water of the verses. So this is metaphorical, obviously. Nothing is going to extinguish the fire of hellfire. If you're in there, it's, it's, the fire is there. Nothing will extinguish that. But what it means by extinguish is that you'll get the benefit of that you would get if the fire is extinguished, meaning you'd be kept away from it. It will protect you. So the, the flames of the hellfire will, will not go out. That's the nature of the hellfire. But the meaning is that you will be given delivery from it, you'll be given escape from it, and you will not be punished in it. That is how powerful the Qur'an is, as long as you can connect. As long as you can connect. The ulama today, they will generally give you adhkar to do, dhikr to do. Because they've tried and tested the dhikr that you can have more focus on them. So that once you start doing it and you develop your concentration, 
and your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're repeating the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example, then that benefits you in recitation of the Quran as well. I was uh, once in a meeting recently and there's one guy who mashallah had apparently uh, connected with the Quran well because he was quoting the Quran quite a bit and he, you know, he was very familiar with it though he was not a hafiz of the Quran and there was somebody else who was saying but how do we connect with the Quran he says just you, need the, you don't need anything else just connect with the Quran now you can just tell somebody connect with the Quran but it's not as easy as that it's a matter of tawfiq that's why there are other strategies that ulama mention that a person first becomes closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by doing something in which you will have to use your heart and your mind and your focus. It will develop that concentration. It will protect you from distraction. It will get you to concentrate. Once you start getting there, then it's, when you read Quran, it will become easier. You will start connecting with the Quran through that. And likewise, when you're in our salat, when we're so distracted, we'll actually start concentrating in our salat. So different strategies work for different people. And but at the end of the day, all of the ibadat that we have is to make us more attentive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's really what the matter is. So the salat we do and the fasting we do, that's just an external shell. It's a form. That's not the objective. Yes, it's a fard and so on. But the whole point of the salat is that we become conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the salat isn't doing that for us, we still have to pray because salat is one of the most effective ways we'll do that. But the concern is that when are we going to get to the next step? So here he says, min wardiha ash-shabimi. Shabim means barid, it means cool. And ward means a watering place, a water source. So he is literally saying that the words of the Quran, the ayat of the Quran are like a cool water source that have the power to extinguish the hellfire. In a metaphorical sense, in the sense that it will protect you from having to go into the hellfire. That's why the kind of reading that is required here is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Quran tartila. Recite the Quran with tartil, which means with ta'addub wa tadabbur, with adab. Adab means etiquette of its words, how they're supposed to be. Drive with some etiquette. What does that mean? Observe the rules. Drive decently. Don't flaunt the laws. Don't just cut people up, etc., etc. So that's what you call adab of reading the Quran is with the tajweed. Stopping in the right places. And secondly, tadabbur, which means reflection. So that's what Allah says in the Quran. Because that is, that is closer that will get you closer to actually having a presence with the Qur'an as opposed to just reading it. The person who just reads the Qur'an very fast and doesn't give the haqq, the rights of the Qur'an, doesn't think, then he's not going to be able to think about the Qur'an. That's why Ali radiallahu anhu karramallahu wajhu said, لا خير في قراءة لا تدبر فيها There's no benefit in qira'a which is in which there's no reflection. ولا خير في عبادة لا فقه فيها and there's no point in any worship in which you don't haven't understood the reason for your worship. So we're not speaking to people who are struggling with just making salat. You know, we're talking on a higher level here. That you look, here, we're doing our salat, we're doing our worship. Let's get to the next stage here. That's why many of the salaf, when they would pass by a verse of rahmah, they would stop and ask Allah for mercy. Or they would repeat it with that presence of mind, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when there was a, 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 a verse of adhab and punishment, then they would cry at that. And the expression would be that, oh Allah, preserve me and protect me from that. That's why people like Hassan Basri, can you imagine? They stood up the whole night, one whole night once he stayed, just reading Amma Yatasa'alun. The surah, Amma that's all he recited the entire night in his salat. Because it is so profound and such a rich surah. You don't need more than that. The, uh, Sheikh um, Ibn Ajiba was from Egypt. Uh, uh, I believe he's from Egypt. He relates from his teacher Abu Sahl. That once in a number of the gatherings this discussion came up. That is dhikr more important or reciting the Quran more important? 
more beneficial rather. They're both good, but should we have a majlis of dhikr or should we have a majlis of reading the Quran, which is more effective for the heart? It says obviously the Sufi sheikhs, they're telling people to do dhikrs. And they're saying that that is superior to uh, reading the Quran because it will give you the presence of the heart. I fully agree with that. Unless you're already connected to the Quran, then it's different. But I fully agree with that myself because just by dealing with people, this is what the issue is. Uh, based on what I explained earlier. But anyway, he said that I thought about this for a while. And then he said I slept. And I wasn't sure which way to go with this, but I slept. And in my sleep, I saw somebody telling me that... He read the following poem. إِذَا الْأَحْبَابُ فَاتَهُمْ أَتَّلَاقِ فَمَا صِلَةٌ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ كِتَابِ That there's nothing superior than the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's no doubt about that. But again, it's the same thing. How do you become so associated with it that it starts profoundly affecting you without you being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first place? So either way, anyway. Then he says, Because in the hereafter, it will extinguish the fire. And like as mentioned in the hadith, that people will come to hellfire, uh, come out of hellfire totally black like um, coal, burnt out, emaciated, totally wasted. But then they will be given resplendence and they will be put into Jannah. Likewise, that is what the Quran does for a person as well. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا دَخَلَ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ When the people of Jann uh, Jannah will enter Jannah and the people of Hellfire will be in Hellfire, then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, take out those people who had at least one atom of Iman in their heart from the Hellfire. Take, take them out now. So they will come out and they would have been totally burnt out and like charcoal, they'll be then thrown into the, the river of life. And then they will grow, they will, they will become vibrant again. Just like a seed suddenly grows when a deluge overcomes it because of the potency of that land. Then he says, وَكَالصِّرَاتِ وَكَالْمِيزَانِ مَعْدِلَةً فَالْقِسْتُ مِنْ غَيْرِهَا فِي النَّاسِ لَمْ يَقُبِ He has these two last, line, uh, two last couplets to finish this section about the Quran. So he says, فَكَالصِّرَاتِ وَكَالْمِيزَانِ this is like the, the path. Uh, the sirat here refers to the causeway in the hereafter, the bridge. The causeway over hellfire that everybody's going to have to go over. In Arabic, the word is sirat, sirat with a sin or zirat. These are all three ways of saying the same thing. And then he says, وَكَلْ mizan, which is the scale in the, in the hereafter. Everybody knows about the scale. It, according to us, it's a physical scale, which will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use to weigh out and he doesn't need to do that. He knows what's stronger, what's more and what's less. But this is to prove in front of us. Ma'dilatan. <laughs> so, like the bridge over hell and the balance of right, justice, they, they are done for justice. فَالْقِسْتُ مِنْ غَيْرِهَا فِي النَّاسِ لَمْ يَقُمِ So, justice made by someone else shall not be true among man mankind. In, in other words, he's saying that Justice has to come from the Quran. Now you might be saying, there are many Muslim countries where there seems to be no justice. A lot of bribery, uh, a lot of corruption, and just a lot of confusion. Whereas you look at a lot of the kind of more thriving uh, societies, which don't seem to be the Muslim ones, although you have a few very good examples like uh, Malaysia and other places. But... Just in our current time, we see that there seems to be a lot of justice. Now, if you look at a lot of the laws of the UK, for example, they're not Islamic laws in the sense that they don't call them Islamic laws. But a lot of the laws in terms of the justice and so on are related to Islamic laws. And some people could go beyond that, that a lot of the laws here were made, and I haven't done any specialized study in this but uh, uh, 
the Hindustan, which is uh, India, the Indian subcontinent was ruled by the British. And one of the first translations of some of our books on jurisprudence, like the Hidayah of Marghinani, was actually translated by one of the, uh, one of the British people who were there about three, four hundred years ago. It says in there that I did this work to present it to the governor of Bengal, uh, Bengal you know, because that's where the headquarters were. East India, uh, uh, was the East India Company, right? So the Bengal was the, the kind of the headquarters for this. So a lot of the laws you can you can trace them through that in general the concept of justice. So justice is very important in that sense. And unfortunately, we have dictatorships where the laws are just uh, made. For example, in Egypt, I remember when I was there in the Mubarak era. And a friend of mine who lives there in Alexandria, he says, it is so bad that if one of the governors or one of the people at the top want to pass by this area at two o'clock in the morning, the guards will come an hour before, wake everybody up, move your cars away, go and put them wherever you have to, right? And they'll just clear the roads, two o'clock in the morning. Can you imagine that happening here? You know, there'd be an uproar. If they want to do something like that, they have to tell you two months in advance that there's going to be a, you know, road works here. But this is some guy who just wants to go past. So just to make sure it's all clear and open, everybody has to move their cars at 2 o'clock in the morning. That's what you call clear. That's not Quran. It's not Quran at all. So, فَالْقِسْتُ مِنْ غَيْرِهَا فِي النَّاسِ لَمْ يَقُمِي The Quran has the laws of everything. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, مَا فَرَّتْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ We haven't left anything out. We've dealt with everything, either specifically, and if not specifically, then definitely in a universal general sense of uh, guidance towards it. Then it's for the ulama to actually apply that guidance in a particular, in a particular way. So the sirat and the mizan are things in the hereafter by which people are going to be tested. Uh, uh, just to clarify a few points, how our deeds and our deeds are done. It's just records now. Right? How are you going to weigh something like that? Good and bad deeds. How are they going to be weighed? So some of the ulama mentioned that it's quite clear. We have books of deeds that are mentioned. Kitab. There's going to be records, registers with all of our deeds in there. Whether that be like a hard drive or whether that be like a physical book or a printout. Whatever it may be. So there's going to be a comparison of those two. The good and the bad. And... Nowadays, it's become much more easier for us to understand these things because we have many, many ways of measuring non-physical entities like non-perceptible elements. We can measure them. We can measure the air in this room. We can measure the heat in this room. We can measure the waves. We can detect different things that we can't see with our eyes. So it becomes much easier to understand these things, that the scale is there, it's going to be able to de detect these things. And Allah knows best exactly what's going to happen and the way it's going to be. What we believe in a physical scale. It's not just a metaphorical expression. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the other thing is that every act a person does, it's going to be given a particular shape or a form. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَأَنَّ سَعْيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى Everybody's attempts and efforts are going to be observable. Now, how are they going to be observable as a record, as a reward, or as a perceptible form? Allah knows best. So, if you try to do justice with a contradiction of the Quran, it won't be established. That's why, if you look at the laws in even the so-called successfully peaceful and stable countries, if you look at the laws that actually go against the Qur'an, for example, those that relate to deviancies and things of that nature, right? then you can see that that's where they've gone wrong. And that's going to cause a massive problem in the communities. But where it's just to do with absolute just fairness in distribution of wealth, for example, in just getting your right, and somebody and having the rights over your own property and for somebody not to violate them then that's perfect so there's the good and bad of course there's the good and bad 
So the hadith mentions that the Quran is the criterion. It is not a jest or a joke. It is a serious book that's a criterion. Anybody who speaks by the Quran will be truthful. Anybody who judges by the Quran will be just. And anybody who practices by the Quran will be rewarded. And anybody who holds fast to it will definitely be guided to the straight path. That's why I said in the beginning, anybody who's got an attachment in the Quran, you will see that their, their focus will just be right in the world. They'll just be very successful in that regard. And anybody who seeks uh, guidance in any way at, with the, to the exclusion of the Quran, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, cause, will, uh, will allow them to deviate. And then finally, he just clarifies one last point. He says, لا تعجبن لحسود راح ينكرها يعني صار ينكرها تجاهلا وهو عين الحاذق الفهم Don't be astonished. Don't be taken aback. Don't be confused by this uh, jealous person who has become, who has, who has continued to or who has started to deny the Quran تجاهلا making himself out to be ignorant of it whereas he has the sight of a person who is well understanding and able and uh, comprehending of the Quran. And this is the people of the past. This was, this was the way they were and there's people like that today as well. That if they looked object- objectively, they'll see the beauty, but they try to overcome it because of some other jealousy or enmity or some other obstinacy that they have. Hasad is one of those things which will definitely prevent anybody Jealousy is a thing which will prevent anybody from being just. And there's no doubt about that. قَدْ نَعْلَمُ إِنَّهُ لَا يَحْزُنُكَ الَّذِي يَقُولُونَ فَإِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, We know that what they say causes you grief. They are denying your prophecy. They are disbelieving in you. But that's because the zalimin, they just want to reject the verses of, the Quran, uh, verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The only reason is that. It's not because they, it's anything personal. They just want to reject that. So that's why they reject you as well. Uh, and uh, the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Yahud, حَسَدًا مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ That this is just out of jealousy and envy from their hearts even after the haqq and the truth has become manifest. And this has been observed. There are many t- times when uh, certain Yahud came to Rasulullah and they asked him a question. He answered it and they said, yes, that's right. That's exactly what our books tell us. We know you're the next prophet. They, that's the whole reason why those three tribes had actually settled in Medina Munawwara because their books had told them after they had to go in exile from, uh, from Iraq, uh, when ne- uh, from Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar came and uh, 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 exiled, exiled or imprisoned uh, these three tribes, they came to Medina Munawwara because that represented the oasis that was pro- prophesied to them. But then when the Prophet came, and then they used to tell the Arabs, they used to tell the Aus and the Khazraj in Medina, that you know our Prophet, the last Prophet is going to come, you guys are like pagans, crazy individuals, don't know anything, we're the enlightened ones, we have a book, etc. Our book tells us there's going to Prophet who's going to come, and when he comes, we're going to side with him and fight against you. And totally the opposite happened. He came out to be of the Arabs. And that is something they could not bear. So then, it was the other way around. And this is not just with them, but this is with some of the Arabs that were against Rasulullah This was one of the reasons. Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Salul was... Uh, the uh, chief hypocrite and the reason why he remained like that is because he was about to become the leader he had been earmarked he'd been uh, uh, he, he'd be he'd been singled out to be the leader or, or one of the great leaders of Medina Munawwara but then when the prophet sallallahu came his leadership went downhill this was just the way he responded to it had he continued and been a good person then just like the others continued and even got more honor, he would have gained honor. But this was, it's a matter of tawfiq. So, the people in that time, they, as, as we've said, you know, they just had these crazy, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, criticisms of the Qur'an. As Allah says, they say, If we wanted, we could also say the same as the Qur'an. But they didn't. They couldn't. They, it was just a claim. 
لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيها They said don't listen to the Quran and when the Quran is being recited cause disturbance That's what they were saying because they just didn't want it to be heard Don't listen to him وَفِي آذَانِنَا وَقْرٌ Some of them used to get even more crazy and say that Oh, we've, we've got something in our ears, a blockage We can't even hear it So that's like really pushing yourself down We can't even hear it anyway So they expressed that One of the most telling points is this You know about Abu Jahl Abu Jahl said this It was only jealousy that stopped him See, because he was of a rival clan To that of the Banu Abd Munaf which is the Prophet Sallallahu clan. Banu Abd Manaf is, uh, and then Abu Jahl's. So, this is what he said. He says, Ta'atayna nahnu wa banu Abd Manaf min al-sharafi. Both us and the Abd Munaf had honor. Both of us could take from that honor. We both shared in that honor. He says, Naharu fa naharna. If they sacrificed their camels, we were also able to sacrifice a camel. Sacrificing a camel is a big deal. You can't just sacrifice, camels are very expensive. And then to sacrifice some for someone is a big deal. So it's like, you know, we can produce Rolls Royces, they can do, we can do that as well. Alright? Uh, if they can feed people, we can also, if they fed people, we can also feed people. They freed slaves, we can also do that. We also did that. Until we both became like two horses, two race horses on the track, قالوا, they suddenly sprung up a, a surprise. They pulled out their card, which was, they said, Minna Nabiyun, Wahyu Mina Samai. Suddenly they came up with this surprise that, oh, we have a prophet, and revelation comes from the heavens. To this prophet, فَمَتَى يُدْرَكُ هَذَا How can we compete with this? How can we acquire this? So, وَاللَّهِ لَا نُؤْمِنْ بِهِ أَبَدًا By Allah, he swears, we will never believe in him. So th this, is, this is the kind of thing, but it's a matter of tawfiq at the end of the day. This could happen to anybody. I'm not going to take that religion. There's people who've converted and they are crying today because their mother doesn't convert. She agrees with it, she sees the beauty of it, she has no animosity, but no, I can't be that. You know, I'm a Southern Baptist, or I'm this, or whatever it, is, whatever it may be, I cannot convert. And these people are crying, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can change hearts. One of the most telling things was something that came, up, uh, came about while we were in uh, Uhud area. When we got to Uhud, in Medina Munawwara, one of the things that came to mind when you listen, look at the story of the Battle of Uhud, you had the Muslims fighting against the Meccan army at the time. The Meccan army, the most prominent commanders, the commander of the entire army was Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. He was not a Muslim at that time. He is considered the Dahiyatul Arab, the most intelligent genius, uh, extremely politically astute, very clever individual. He was leading the battle. The right flank was being led by Khalid bin Walid. And the left one, Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. And along them was Abu Sufyan, one of the commanders, and his wife Hind. Five individuals who were enemies of Islam at that time, fighting against the Muslims. And that was the setback. Khalid bin Walid noticed the archers had left the hill, and thus, the story, I don't want to go into the story, but that's the story. But all five of these, just within a few years, within, within six, seven, eight years, all became Muslim. So subhanAllah, the dua we made down there, which was an inspiration based on this story, is that, oh Allah, all these great enemies that we would never think, who would think Hind, who on that day, because Hamza radiallahu an, who was martyred on that day, and he is the one who had killed some of her family members, she went and cut him up, and took out his liver and chewed on it. This is the enemy we're talking about. This level of enmity. And they suddenly all turn around. And this Hind eventually says, the worst household in my sight before, the most hated was the Prophet's household. Today becomes the most beloved household to me. And despite 
the fact that her daughter was married to the Prophet ﷺ, Abu Sufyan's daughter was married to the Prophet ﷺ from before Ummu Habiba. She's the first one to convert. Then her brother Muawiyah radiallahu anh, converted after that. Then Abu Sufyan and his wife converted at the, at the conquest of Makkah. But if that can happen there, then today the greatest enemies we have that you could be swearing and cursing at, you could also make a dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turn them right around and make them some of the greatest. So Amr ibn As is responsible for Egypt coming into Islam. Khalid ibn Walid, numerous areas that you can't count. Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, he had his, there's Abu Sufyan who stuck with the Prophet during the Battle of Hunayn and so on and so forth. So things can turn around. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us worthy. Obviously, this is the Prophet sallallahu dua. It's a Sahaba's dua that does these things. But the ummah, they need to muster up the strength to make Islam and ibadah their second nature. Then these things, inshallah, will happen as well. So then he finally says, فَلَا تُنْكِرُ الْعَيْنِ ضَوْءَ الشَّمْسِ مِنْ رَمَدٍ وَيُنْكِرُ الْفَمُ طَعْمَ الْمَاءِ مِنْ سَقَمِ That's why uh, sometimes you have an eye with a cataract. Eyes with some, a sick eye. It may deny the light of the sun. Sun is out. I can't see the sun. There's no sun. It's darkness. It's night. Or sick tongue may even abhor the taste of pleasant water. But that doesn't affect the water at all. For everybody else, they benefit from the water. So one guy is complaining, but everybody else is enjoying it. It's like, leave him alone, man. You know, uh, he can't see the sun, he can't see the water. Subhanallah. So, that's the same thing with the Quran. Let us not be deterred by those who criticize. So I get an email, uh, what is it, a few days ago, and it's a refutation of a particular scholar. Uh, one of our scholars of the UK. It's a particular refutation of him by somebody who disagrees with him. And when you actually listen to this, about a five-minute clip, he not only dis, uh, he, he not only uh, refutes him, but he refutes about uh, seven other famous scholars around the world. So it's like he's got a problem with everybody, right? Then he sends me another clip, this guy, and this one is a refutation of the Tablighi Jamaat. The first one I listened to, it was short... I was a bit curious myself of what's going on here. Otherwise, I don't have time for these kind of refutations. You check online for any scholar, and there'll be a refutation probably anyway. Right? There's going to be criticism. The Prophet ﷺ was criticized, so why not anybody else? What's the problem? Right? It's normal. The world, that's the way it is. So, for my first response was, these are all uh, uh, false accusations. These are distortions, and these are exaggerations. And I got the second email about the Tablighi Jamaat, and I said, you know what? If you look around, you're going to find a lot of these. You think you're going to keep studying these and confusing yourself and then asking for a response? Why are you even bothering with them? Why be like a pig that whenever it goes into an orchard, it looks for the dirt? Be like a nightingale that when it goes into an orchard, it looks for the nice flowers. What's your perspective? Where are you going? If you notice in an orchard, if a nightingale comes in, it'll look for the nice flowers, it'll sit on there and sing. Whereas the pig, it'll look for the dirty parts, it'll find it because that's what it's accustomed to. So why do that and then try to rectify? It's crazy. Corrupt yourself first and then say, I'm, I want to you know, purify me. So one needs to be careful uh, and make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about these things. But the one thing he's saying here is that don't worry about what others say. You benefit from it because you can see the benefit. And don't be confused by the fact that some people can't see the benefit. They're looking at it with sick eyes and a sick heart. Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah to protect us from, which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us relief from and protection until we until we die. Wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak tiyad al jalali wa ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma ya hannan wa ya mannan. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahli sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us association with the Qur'an O oh Allah, open up our hearts for the Qur'an Allow the Qur'an to influence and affect our hearts O oh Allah, grant us the sweetness of our faith O oh Allah, O oh Allah, grant us sweetness in our faith In our salat, in our prayers, in our worship so Allah, we become closer to doing that worship. Oh Allah, oh Allah, there are many. We ask you for 
forgiveness from all those sins that have put up the blockades in, in our hearts, which deprive us of gaining the sweetness of our salat and our worship and of your dhikr and your remembrance. Oh Allah, we seek protection from all those sins that have brought about darkness in our hearts, that have brought about misery in our lives, that have brought about problems and calamities, that have brought about the depressions and problems in our life. O oh Allah, we ask you for forgiveness from all of these calamities. O oh Allah, we ask that you grant us closeness to you, you grant us the ability to remember you and to be conscious of you at all times. O oh Allah, we ask that you protect us from all the evil that is out there. We ask that you grant us happiness in this world and especially happiness in the hereafter. Make the happiest and most satisfying day the day that we stand in front of you. O oh Allah, there is so much satisfaction that we have when we stand in front of your house in this world, in front of the Kaaba, and we listen to the Quran being recited. There is no greater pleasure than that. O oh Allah, allow us to have that same kind of pleasure in the hereafter when we stand in front of you. O oh Allah, grant us the company of your Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and reward him and bless him to, on, the, on behalf of his entire Ummah as much as he deserves and beyond and, and beyond that. Subhan Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun Wasalamun Al Mursaleen Walhamdulillah. Oh.